In this next section, we're going to look at human rights treaties, or primarily what treaties are and how they fit into public international law, because treaties are now one of the probably most important parts of the source of and evidence of public international law. And as we know, the human rights are kind of based on those nine core conventions. So it's not just limited to those nine core conventions. So let's look at what treaties are and what they mean. So firstly, in terms of what a treaty is, to be a treaty, it has to be an agreement in writing between two legal personalities at the international level, which typically tend to be states. So when at least um, two states um, join a treaty, when, it, when at least two states have an agreement in writing between themselves, that can be a treaty. Now, there are lots of kind of other regulations, say with human rights treaties, there's often a number of countries that have to agree to that treaty before it, become, before it can, can become a treaty. So, for example, I think for children's rights, it was about 20, for ICCPR, I think it was 35. It meant that that number of states had to agree to that treaty before it could be actually become an international treaty. Now, that treaty then is governed by international law, and that law comes out of, well, comes out of the sources and evidence of, say, custom and general principles and so on. But it also means that there's like the law of treaties in terms of how these um, treaties are interpreted and understood and also what the International um, Court of Justice says in terms of how a treaty works. Now, importantly, all that kind of, that, what that really means is that, that if it's a treaty, it's going to create legal obligations. There are, they are legally binding in nature, which means that once the state has agreed to that treaty, they agree to be legally bound by that treaty, which means that if they don't comply with the treaty, there can be sanctions against them. When it's set, those sanctions may be quite weak, they may be quite strong. But it means that they've agreed to that, they've agreed to this law, they've agreed to be bound to that, and they've also agreed that they can be sanctioned or punished if they don't respect that treaty. Okay, so next, in terms of how a treaty is interpreted. So this is based on the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which is what I just mentioned before. And this is the main kind of, it's like the treaty of treaties and how they're understood and how they work. Now, there's a couple of important things to understand here. First is that even though I've been talking about treaties being voluntary and also treaties and also states who ratify them have this kind of freedom of interpretation, that's not really the full freedom to interpret it how they want. You know, there is what may be called some kind of wiggle room or some flexibility or some margin of discretion in terms of interpreting a treaty, but states don't have full, the full freedom to interpret a treaty however they want. Now, this is different from contract law and domestic law, where there is often an agreed upon understanding or interpretation of a law, and that person can't really change that interpretation. You know, the courts or other bodies have to change that interpretation. But like 60 kilometers an hour is the speed limit, that can't be reinterpreted as 70 kilometers or 80 kilometers an hour. The law has to be changed. Whereas in international law, there is some flexibility in terms of interpretation. Okay, but that flexibility is limited by, firstly, what the object and the purpose of the treaty is. So the, the, um, the laws in that treaty have to kind of conform with what the ob objective of the treaty is and what the purpose of the treaty is. And what that means is like a human right can't be interpreted to violate human rights. The object and purpose of the human rights treaty is the dignity of the person and equality and non-discrimination and all these other human rights values. So a state can't reinterpret the human rights treaty, which goes against those objects and purposes. They can't interpret a right to actually allow for the violation of rights. Okay, so the interpretation has to be limited by what the object and the purpose of the treaty is. Also that interpretation has to kind of form along the lines of these other ways in which it's interpreted, such as what's called the Trevor Propere, a preparatory. I'm sure I've mispronounced that. But this is basically the preparation work that was made to write that treaty, what the drafts of the treaty intended when they wrote it. So most treaties have this kind of document, which is the, uh, the kind of the preparation work, which details the arguments, the understandings, the drafters of that treaty had to help interpret those rights. Also in terms of interpretation, we've got the preamble of the treaty. Now in a couple of classes time, actually, Next week, we'll look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We can look at the preamble. We can see in that preamble, it kind of details, this is how you understand human rights. 
So the preamble, which is a part of the, the treaty that comes before the actual working, um, working articles, helps the, to assist the understanding and interpretation of the treaty. And of course, the last one is in how states have interpreted so far what's been the practice of interpretation. And the key points here means that though there is freedom to interpret a treaty, and states have some discretion or wiggle room to interpret the treaty, it is going to be limited by what the purpose of the treaty is, how, how other states understand it, and how it was meant to be understood. Okay, now in terms of human rights treaties, it's important to see that the treaties uh, may be called different names and may have different titles, but they all are basically the same legally binding document. So they may have different names, as we know that human rights treaties, we have covenants and conventions. A covenant just means a very important treaty, but it doesn't give it any different legal obligations. Sometimes you have names like agreements and pacts and accords, which tend to be used in terms of trade agreements and also peace agreements. So like the, um, uh, the peace agreement of Israel and Palestine was called an accord. We have NAFTA, which is a North American free trade agreement. And um, so with these are various um, names for treaties, but basically they have the same legal obligations. Now, another important one for human rights is that some treaties are called protocols. What a protocol is, it's a, a treaty which is an addition or an add on to an existing treaty. So as we'll look at soon in human rights, there are nine treaties and nine protocols. And so the number of treaties have an additional protocol and these just add rights or add certain elements to that treaty. So a protocol doesn't stand alone, it doesn't stand by itself, it is just an addition to an existing treaty. Okay, now looking at human rights treaties, we have nine. They tend to be known by their acronyms like ICER, International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, ICESCR, ICCPR and so on. Now you see, for example, the first human rights treaty, ICERD, was adopted by the General Assembly in 1965. We'll go over soon what that means, but basically the United Nations agreed that this should become a treaty. And they said, here's the document that states can agree to become a treaty. And it came into force, which means that it has enough countries agreeing to it, and it becomes an international treaty in 1969. Now there is a story behind why ICERD was the first treaty, but we're gonna look at that next week when we look at the UDHR. So after we have ICE, we have the two covenants, ICESCR and ICCPR. These are both kind of like the codification for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the UDHR, which is a declaration, not a treaty. And so it's not, the UDHR is not fully legally binding, like ICESCR and ICCPR. It was codified and then adopted in 1966 and came into force in 1976. So from the UDHR in 1948 to these other two documents, it did take like um, 28 years, is that right? About 28 years for them to actually become legally binding documents. Then we have women's rights in the 1970s, then the Convention Against Torture in the 1980s, and then we have CRC in the 1990s. Okay. Uh, following, following CRC in the 1990s, we just have three more treaties on migrant workers, disability, and Forced disappearances, the most recent treaty which came into force in 2010. And you'll see we've just kind of completed the 2020, so just completed the, the 2010s with no new treaty. So there hasn't really been a treaty adopted now for at least 14 years, which is a very long patch. But there are some other treaties in the pipeline, and that includes treaties about human rights defenders, and this possibility for one on sexuality but that's not even in the drafting stage yet but still there's been a, a long time since the last um, human rights treaty now alongside the treaty a number of the conventions we see six of the conventions six of the treaties have optional protocols now, the most common optional protocol is on individual complaints which allows individuals to make complaints to what's known as the treaty body of the united nations and you see there's one for icpscr one for iccpr ones for CEDAW and CRC and disability. Now the other type of um, optional protocol is to kind of add a certain type of um, right or to add some articles and that's ones for the death penalty, children in armed conflict, child um, trafficking and prostitution as well, are these kind of protocols which add certain rights. Okay, 
Now, finally, let's look at what this process of how a treaty becomes a treaty. We're going to look at this in two stages. The first stage is more the kind of advocacy and politics around this treaty. So what would happen to most of those treaties, like torture and children and disability, is that advocacy groups would have come together to say, we need to have an international human rights treaty on this area. And these coalitions would discuss and lobby and work with states to try and get this idea going about having a treaty on, say, women's rights. Now we see this occurring now around indigenous rights, for example. Indigenous groups have been lobbying for the creation of a indigenous um, a convention on, on indigenous rights. Now that has been kind of stalled for the past 10 years, but there is a draft declaration on indigenous rights. But that's so it's at that advocacy stage where these different groups and states meet and say we need to have this treaty. So you can see that treaties kind of come out of a political force, out of a political will. Now, when there's enough kind of advocacy, then it gets introduced to the UN system. So human rights treaties go through the United Nations. That doesn't mean that all treaties go through the UN because some treaties like the ones on um, armed conflict go through the International um, Red Cross, International Committee of the Red Cross. And other treaties may go through regional bodies. So it differs how, what body kind of writes that treaty. But for human rights, it's the United Nations. At the United Nations, then they codify and draft that declaration. That's more and more using, say, civil society and expert input, whereas previously it's many states that would write the treaty. Now that may go through a stage of first a draft, draft declaration and then becoming a treaty. But this is basically the process of turning those advocacy ideas into um, legal language, into legal codification and legal rights. And once they're happy with that, it's then adopted at the General Assembly. So you see the picture below the General Assembly, which means that states agree that this draft of this document treaty is good enough to be made a treaty. Now, when it's adopted by the General Assembly, it doesn't mean it's a treaty. It doesn't mean it has any legally binding force, but it means that states are then free to start the process to make this into a treaty, which we'll look at at the next stage. So we'll just finish this section here before we look at this, what's known as the ratification process.